Hello everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Mikhail and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Technology, Sydney. And today I'd like to present my work, or some of my work that I've um, managed to publish earlier this year, titled Low Oxygen Effects, Photophysiology and the Level of um, Expression of Two Carbon Metabolism Genes in the Seagrass Sostrum Mulleri. So just a bit of background on the specifics of my work. Um, Basically, I worked with Zostra mulleri, which is a closely related species of seagrass similar to Zostra marina. However, this is found um, specifically within Australia, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea, as you can see on the map here, highlighting in the yellow, oh, sorry, in the orange. <laughs> um, they're typically characterized by their thin, strap shaped leaves and are considered to be C3 plants. Um, so, just to go over the C3 and C4 plants, um, as it's important for the rest of the talk. Uh, essentially here on the left we have a schematic of a C3 photosynthetic system uh, whereby carbon dioxide is um, diffusing into the mesophyll cell where it can carboxylate ribulose bisphosphate. This produces a three carbon molecule, hence the name C3, uh, which is further reduced into a sugar used by the plant. Uh, the schematic on the right is a C4 model, so um, in this case carbon dioxide diffuses into the mesophyll cell However, it is converted to um, bicarbonate via the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Uh, this bicarbonate is then um, able to carboxylate phosphoenolpyruvate via the enzyme phosphoenolpyruvate carboxylase, producing a four carbon molecule, hence the name C4, which is then transported into the bundle sheet cell um, where it is further decarboxylated, releasing carbon dioxide, um, which is then available to uh, fix carbon, essentially. And this two-cell system has been typically referred to as Kranz anatomy and is a form of carbon concentrating mechanism in a sense that it is able to concentrate carbon dioxide around ribulose bisphosphate within the bundle sheath cell. Now, this is important as ribulose bisphosphate is not specific. Um, essentially, ribulose bisphosphate can be both carboxylated or oxygenated. So when it is carboxylated, it leads to sugar production. However, when it is oxygenated, it leads to a loss of carbon and is um, energy costing for the plant. So why is this important for seagrass? Well, essentially, seagrasses in the past have been considered to be um, C3 plants due to the fact that they do not have the Kranz anatomy, which I showed before. However, up until about the 1980s, um, new evidence have come out suggesting that seagrasses could potentially be photosynthesizing in a different way. Um, key among them, well, one of the first few lines of evidence is the fact that um, the, the fractionation signature of the 13C stable isotope within the seagrasses actually resemble more of a um, terrestrial C4 plant. Um, and in addition, due to the emergence of molecular profiling tools such as proteomics, um, transcriptomics, and as Peter mentioned, um, this has basically uh, given us a more in-depth view of what is actually happening in the genes within Zostra marina and Zostra mulo. Um, and as the transcriptome of these two seagrass species has been um, published, we were able to see the presence of some of the key genes involved in the C4 pathway, such as phosphoenopyruvate oxalase and carbonic anhydrase. So this led us to sort of wonder a couple of questions. Um, one is, what is the significance of these genes um, and how are they regulated when seagrass is photosynthesized? And if they are regulated, um, how are they responding to different changes in the environment? And so the specific aims of my project was to investigate how the photosynthetic and respiratory rates are affected um, by experimentally reduced oxygen concentration in the water column. And we did this by using um, electrochemical microsensors. We also wanted to investigate how the reduced oxygen concentration affects the expression levels of um, phosphoenopyruvate carboxylase and carbonic anhydrase. And we did this by using um, molecular methods such as the reverse transcription real-time qPCR. So just briefly going over the materials and methods of my work, um, I collected Zostra mulleri from Pittwater, Australia, which is about two hours north of Sydney. I um, exposed a group of seagrass to um, a low oxygen treatment of nine micromoles of oxygen per litre over a period of 24 hours. And I did this by bubbling the water with nitrogen gas. Uh, this also had the effect of removing um, dissolved inorganic carbon um, so essentially it was removing all of the bicarb and the CO2. And so to mitigate this, we um, also bubbled CO2 into the water or back into the water. And 
we controlled it by uh, measuring the pH and maintaining the pH at 8.16 within the treatment and the control. Um, we also, uh, sorry, so at the end of this 24 hour period, we um, measured the oxygen production uptake using oxygen microsensors, such as this one here. And then using the transcriptomic data um, <coughs> that we, or that UTS published earlier, um, we were able to design specific primers for the phosphine and pyruvate carboxylase and carbonic and hydrose enzymes. And then we use those to perform the um, gene expression analysis. So moving on to the materials, uh, sorry, the, um, the results. I just want to go over the main results from my, from my paper. Um, essentially, we use the oxygen microsensors to measure the oxygen flux within the diffusive brown G layer, uh, just above the leaf. And applying fixed first law of diffusion, we were able to calculate the net photosynthetic rate um, in, res in relation to the incident radiance. So here on the PI curve, we have um, photosynthetic rate on the y-axis and incident radiance on the x-axis. And we essentially were able to plot these points. Um, the black, oh sorry, the uh, solid um, data points are the control. The, um, the open triangles are the, um, the low oxygen treatment. And what we found was after a period of 24 hours, um, essentially the alpha or the um, initial slope of the curve was enhanced under low oxygen conditions. Similarly, when we performed the RTQPCR, we found a significant difference within the uh, normalized uh, relative quantity of the two genes, PEPC and CA. Um, and as you can see here, uh, compared to the control, there was a significant decrease in these two genes. So what does this all mean? Well, essentially, under, obviously under control conditions, uh, photosynthesis and photorespiration are occurring as they normally would. And um, carbonic anhydrase and phosphine or oxalase um, are being expressed at the regular level. However, when we apply a low oxygen treatment over 24 hours, what we think is happening is that the reduced oxygen concentration within the water column is potentially reducing the instances of photorespiration and in thereby enhancing the photosynthesis. Um, this is somewhat supported by the, um, the increased alpha of the PI curve that I showed earlier. And this, this basically explains why we're seeing a decrease in um, the two genes which are typically associated with a carbon concentrating mechanism or a C4 pathway. Uh, so basically, this is somewhat um, typical of a C3 plant. However, the fact that this is being downregulated in response to a low oxygen condition implies that there is definitely something else going on other than just the plain old CO3, uh, C3 photosynthetic pathway. Um, however, there were some limitations of the work. Um, key among them was that I only just looked at the gene, um, gene expression. And as Peter mentioned before, there are other levels to this. So we didn't look at the proteins, we didn't look at how um, active those proteins were, and we didn't look at the metabolites. Uh, also, I only looked at two of the genes. Um, if you look at the KEGMAP keg pathways of photosynthesis, obviously there's a whole myriad of other genes that you could look at. And also, um, I didn't look at how these genes responded to an increase in oxygen um, concentration within the water. So these are some of the things that I'll be looking at further in my PhD, and hopefully I'll have some answers to these questions in the future. Uh, I'd like to thank my fellow co-authors, um, two of which are sitting at the back there. Uh, without their help, I wouldn't have been able to do the work. Uh, this, I'd also like to thank the funding bodies, also um, the professional and technical staff at UTS for their support. And I'd also like to thank the uh, Vice Chancellor's Postgraduate Research Student Conference Fund and the Eva Maria Koch Student Travel Grant for their financial assistance. And thank you. Thank you, Mikael. That was really good timing. <laughs> um, anyone has questions? Sorry. Uh, uh, nice work. Thanks. Um, would you go so far to say that this um, Zostera Mueller, Mueller yeah, Mueller I, yeah. Mueller I, uh, is sometimes a C4 plant under low oxygen conditions? Um, and, is, and that that's the basis for its CCM? Well, at the moment, I can't really say for sure because, as I said before, we've only got the, um, the gene expression data. Um, I have done a little bit of work with protein activity, um, and so far I haven't really seen any changes within the activity of Pepsi. And getting the activity of CA has been a little bit problematic so far, so 
at the moment, at this stage, I would say no. Thank you. Very nice work. Uh, just an idea. Yep. Uh, since both carbonic anhydrase and, and, and PEP carboxylase is used in other parts of, of, of the cell, yep. as you know, of course. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and some water plants or aquatic plants use them to instead have a facult facultative uh, can. Okay. So they can actually swim, uh, uh, switch. Oh, sorry, I can't talk today. They okay. can switch between C3 and CAM when they need. Right. And they would need the same uh, uh, enzymes. Okay. So Could that be a possibility? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I haven't really looked at how they photosynthesize or how they produce sugars at night. So. I don't know what I was just saying. That's an alternative explanation. Yeah, um, it's definitely something I haven't looked at, so uh, it's yeah. something that I will look at now. That's interesting. Um, well, it's old work though, that they have checking on that, but yeah. some freshwater aquatic plant do that. Yeah, yeah, I've been reading a lot into the whole you know, C3, C4 debate, so okay. I'll have to do more reading, actually. <laughs> Thanks. How about manipulating the carbon availability? Um, well, if we change the carbon chemistry of the water, we also potentially are affecting um, other things, so like the pH will definitely change. So we can't really isolate the effect that we see in the genes to um, a change in the carbon, because it could be a response to the pH. So that would be a bit more difficult, I would say, but yeah. Yeah, that's a bit following up this question. Uh, I mean, in the field, oxygen and CO2, they are covariating. I mean, like DIC uh, yep. with a ratio that is a bit higher than one, but I think it's due to the same event processes. Um, do you expect different results if you start uh, inducing covariation of uh, DIC and oxygen, or do you think they don't care? Um, if it was possible to look at just the genes by manipulating um, DIC, it could actually be informative, um, just in the fact that you know, C4 is more of a carbon concentrating thing, whereas uh, C3 isn't. So if you are seeing sort of a decline in sort of the, um, I guess the other genes associated with concentrating the carbon in higher carbon concentrations, then maybe that could suggest that um, that CCM is actually truly working. And then I guess you could build a story on top of that. But yeah, I'm struggling to find out how to do that without affecting other things, such as the pH. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But yeah, gene expression is it's a bit tricky. Thanks. Thanks, for that excellent talk.